Okay, so Reese has challenged me in 30 minutes to actually cover off on a whole heap of things for you today. Number one, how to measure success when it comes to social media, because that's what I specialise in. Understanding the landscape at your disposal on a, a social media perspective, both global and local. Okay, and managing your online reputation. And apparently I'm meant to do all of this in 30 minutes. It's probably three topics I talk about six hours on normally, so we'll see how we go. So, first up, it's good to understand what the landscape looks like in Australia and also in the world. Okay, so Facebook by far is the giant of social media, both globally and locally. Um, but YouTube in Australia sits right next to Facebook. So when people are talking to you about content and things like that, it's important to understand we still go to YouTube to find out how to do all the things that we want to know how to do. Okay, so Instagram has grown significantly in Australia in the last 12 months, up from uh, 6 million to 9 million active users in Australia. But if you're talking to um, either immigrants or people from the Asia, Pacific, China, elsewhere, you really need to start looking at things like WhatsApp and WeChat. Uh, I've got Snapchat up there, but the reality is most of you should not be doing Snapchat. And the reason that I say that is because you don't have the time, the resources and the attention to do it justice. Okay? So if you're going to take on a platform like Snapchat where the content disappears all the time, you have to be generating regular content. So it's fine to do it if you're prepared to commit the time and effort that it takes. And also not to forget things like TripAdvisor and Yelp, which can make or break people like publicans who have pubs where you want to drive people in. So all of these things are important to consider. But like I said, Facebook is the giant. So when you're looking at Facebook in Australia, it's good to look at the age demographic breakdown. So who are you actually talking to on there in Australia? If your target is 18 to 25 year olds, you're about level pegging skewed, like male and female. But interestingly, when you get to the 56 to 65 and up, there's a significantly more, larger number of women than there are men on the platform. And making a gross generalisation, I'm going to assume that that's because their children are breeding and they want to see the photos of their grandkids. Okay, but there is actually a market on there for that. So, bearing all of these things in mind, what do we do about the fact that organic reach is apparently dead? And we've had Armageddon when it comes to organic reach. So, you need to be a lot clearer about what it is that you post, why it is that you're posting it, and you also need to gate your posts by interest. So, for those of you that may or may not be aware, you can actually go into your page settings and optimise your audiences for posts, which allows you to hide posts from people who aren't interested in those posts. Okay, this can be particularly important when it comes to organic reach because Facebook tests and measures your content and its engagement and based on that level of engagement, we'll decide whether or not your content's any good, okay? So the more interesting and relevant is the better. First thing that you have to do when you're doing that is get really clear about what your brand presence is, okay? So if you're a watered down vanilla brand, I'm really close to that mic, so I'm gonna go stand over this side. So if you're a watered down brand and you're posting a whole heap of vanilla content, so you've been caught up in selling instead of having a conversation with people on social media, you're not going to get very good organic reach, okay? If you're someone like Fruchox, for argument's sake, they get fantastic organic reach. Sometimes they reach over 50,000 people with an organic post without boosting it at all, and it's because they're really true to their brand. They don't try to be anything that they're not, but they're fun, people love Fruchox, it's chocolate, for God's sake, what's not to love about it? But the reality is that they also involve their local community, so they get a lot of user-generated content, which also works well. Okay, so once you're clear on what that brand personality is, you need to constantly reinforce your message and post content that's relevant both to your business and to your target market. But first, you need to be really clear about who your target persona is on the different social media channels. All right, so just because you have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, maybe you do have Snapchat, maybe you've got Pinterest, doesn't mean you're talking to the same people on all of those platforms. So you can't package the content the same way. For a show of hands, those of you that do have Facebook and Instagram, how many of you post exactly the same content across both platforms? Yeah, it's a bad thing to do, okay? The reason being, only nine million Australians have an Instagram account and 15 million Australians have a Facebook account. So if you do the math, 
There's six million users on Facebook that do not speak in hashtags. They do not understand at symbols, so if you're automatically sharing content across from your Instagram page and not editing it, you're hurting their heads. If you hurt their heads, you're creating a psychological bump. You create a psychological bump. They're not going to engage with your content. Is that fair? Yeah? Okay. So, those things being said, you need to get clear about who are you talking to. Have a look at your insights in your pages, your analytics. There's a really good tool that you can use called Social Report that will give you great audience breakdowns and also give you the optimal times to post for comments, likes, mentions, those kinds of things. And then you want to dig a little bit deeper, okay? So once you know who those profiles are that you're talking to, you need to flesh them out. And this is a subjective thing. So you need to find out what those people's pain points are, what their interests are, what their attitudes and beliefs are towards your industry and also towards your brand. And the way that you go about doing that is in a number of different ways. Number one, you can do old school net promoter score surveys to find out what some of those things are. I went to a conference workshop with Robin Colday, who's speaking a bit later, and we had to ring 20 of our clients and actually have a conversation with them, which is unheard of today. We usually email people or text them. I rang them and got feedback, and I learned all this stuff that I didn't know, that they actually were interested in, that I could then feed back to them and talk to them about on my different social channels. So get in the habit of paying attention to and surveying your customers about what it is that they're interested in but also what their objections are. So what gets in the way of a sale? So fashion and basic, or fashion and retail in that perspective is quite easy. But you know, retail is across all sorts of different industries and you'll have all sorts of different objections to closing the deal or making the sale. If you know what those standard objections are, you can actually unpack them and pre-educate your customers through your social channels, okay? So get really clear about what those things are. And then once you've built those personas and you're really clear about it, then you can create custom audiences through your Facebook advertising or your Twitter advertising or your Instagram advertising to put your message that's crafted for the right audience in front of the right people. Which is usually when people start to make a mistake because they think that you just have to serve one ad to that target audience and money will rain from the sky. Okay, social media doesn't actually work that way. I'm not very popular sometimes when I say this, but the reality is just because you have digital doesn't mean that you get to stop all the other ways that you advertise traditionally. What's really good about digital is you can use it to really powerfully back in other advertising methods that you're using. All right. It's also good to add a heap of integrations to your Facebook pages. Okay, so I don't know how many of you have noticed, but your Facebook pages are turning into mini websites now. It's just about unlimited what you can put on there. You've got the Facebook store, you've got all sorts of other different services and things that you can list. There are menu apps that you can tie in for restaurants and things like that. So really have a look at your page set up and make sure that you've got the right template according to Facebook that gives you the most functionality that your customers actually want. So, and that changes all the time. That being said, the other thing that people often struggle with is content, okay? We run out of ideas. If we've had our business for a really long time, we run out of things to talk about and we think that what we do is actually not that interesting. So it's good to curate evergreen content Okay, and this is a really basic example of evergreen content, which is admittedly humorous, so it's always going to last longer, but that appeared in my newsfeed 18 hours after it was posted, which is an unusually long lifespan for a piece of content on Facebook without being boosted. Okay, so it's the most powerful content at your disposal. When you look at your um, post data in the back of your insights page or your tweet data on your Twitter account or so on and so forth, are you taking note of the posts that performed really, really well where the content still will continue to be timeless or have a benefit to your audience down the track? Because those kinds of posts are ones that you can repackage or do differently. So for argument's sake, if you posted a link to a blog article that was to do with, I don't know, let's call it fashion and having personal shoppers, then if that performed really well, my next step would be to do a live Facebook video talking about what was in the article. Okay, so you're repurposing it. The content clearly hit a note 
and doing a live video is going to send a notification to all my followers, which is going to get me organic reach, which is really important. Okay, so simple purpose for repurposing evergreen content, select posts that have done well, approach content from a different angle, and publish your repurposed content at different times. Okay, so one of the other things that we tend not to do is to test, consistently test and ongoingly test when the best times are to post to reach new people. All right, we tend to post at set times regularly. It's easier for us, but the reality is that have you tried, for argument's sake, posting at 11 o'clock at night? So if you think about, I'm going to use a really old school example now. Back in the day when I worked in hospitality and I was 18, and I would finish work at 3 o'clock in the morning or something, and I would get home, do you know what would be on the TV? Infomercials about ad blaster machines. Okay, and the reason that they were on the TV at 3 o'clock in the morning is they knew damn well that lonely people who were probably overweight were sitting in front of their televisions eating ice cream. So they sold lots of ad blaster machines. If you look at your website data and you're getting a peak or a spike in traffic to your website at specific times that are outside of the norm, it stands to reason that's a good time to post your content. Okay, it's also a good time to run your ads if you're going to schedule them. So... You can curate other people's content. You can do a roundup of the latest fashion looks or the best recipes for winter or whatever else it might be. All of those things are interesting to other people. Okay, so you also, with your content, want to make sure that all your posts have the persuasive checks and balances. So have solid visuals. Don't be too formal with your text. Have a personality. So one of the questions that I always like to ask my clients is, if your business was a famous person, who would they actually be? Like, who is it that actually embodies who you are? Because the minute that you can give me a famous person's name, then I have a much better understanding of your tone of voice and the colour and the types of humour that I can use than if you just tell me about your business. Does that make sense to everybody? Like, it's really simple. Particularly if you're working with an agency, you really need to nail down your tone of voice so that they get it right. So, don't be too formal, keep it short and snappy, ask a pertinent question. A pertinent question isn't like and share my post, that's not a pertinent question and it doesn't really work much anymore, we're kind of tired of being told to share things. Pertinent questions mean, we're having an argument in the office right now between the online director and social media AOK -okay as to whether gingerbread babies are better than lamingtons. We can't settle it. We want to know which one you'd rather have for morning tea. That's a pertinent question, okay? So be human and have a clear call to action. So don't be afraid to ask for what you want on your posts. Facebook groups is kind of the next thing or is the current thing. So if you have a um, brand or a business or a product or a service that lends itself to a specific niche, it's a great thing if you can create a group and target that and talk to those people, not about what you do, but talk to them about what's interesting to them. The only problem with Facebook groups is they're massively time consuming to administer. All right, so a great example of a fantastic, highly engaged Facebook group is um, SA Women Connecting Women. I think I've said that right. Carly Thompson Berry, she does it really, really well. So she administers it all by herself though. And very occasionally she will lose her temper because she spent like three hours deleting spam posts where somebody's broken the rules. However, it is the one place where you can still get engagement and you can now live stream into your groups, which is even better. That's a good thing as well. All right. So, like I said, the clock is ticking, so there's no easy answer to the timing question. You need to consider the location of, and that of your audience, your audience profile. So, when you're talking profile... Think about the life of the person who you actually want to talk to. Okay, but don't assume, like I said, you don't necessarily know what it is that your customers or your followers or your fans are interested in or what they want. So one of the best ways that you can find that out without just doing a straight out poll is go and join some closed groups or some forums that have your target audience. Okay, because if you do that, then you'll actually get a feel for the types of conversations that are happening and what the pain points of your audience are. So, sensible questions to ask. I promised Reese I would cover some of these and I'm hoping I'm going all right for time. If you're talking to an agency, and I don't just mean a social media agency, I mean any digital agency, any agency that wants you to sign a big check and pay you, 
you need to ask them what experience do they have working with your industry. Don't just assume that they're going to be able to do what it is that they need to do for you, particularly if they're not even going to come and meet you before they send you a quote. All right, so the golden rule of thumb is a good digital operator or a marketing consultant or a PR consultant will come and meet you and find out what it is that you're trying to achieve in your business before they propose solutions for you. So that's number one. Number two, what kind of reporting and analytics are you gonna get? Okay, so here are some of those acronyms, none of which made them onto Reese's family feud thing, unfortunately, but click-through rate, unique reach, impressions, frequency and conversions are all things that you want to be looking at with your ads. Okay, so ads that you're doing on Facebook or on LinkedIn or anywhere else for that matter. You can track a lot of these things through the platform itself, but you can also track a lot of it through Google Analytics if you set up your goals properly in the back end of your website. And to be perfectly honest, I, track Google, I trust Google Analytics more than I trust Facebook Analytics. So at the end of the day, Google Tag Manager is your friend. Okay, you also want to look at reach, growth, clicks and traffic to your website from your organic posting. And so it's good to break those things down. So what does that even mean? From an advertising context, okay, once you've got your audiences right, if you've created those custom audiences and you've loaded up the pixel codes on your website, you should be able to create look-alike audiences. So the top 1% match to the people who are already your target customers. Okay, so that's the advantage of Facebook because it stalks everybody. Facebook knows when you're sleeping, when you're awake, where you shop, whether you abandoned that cart yesterday, whether you're gonna come back and buy it. So I always know when I'm spending too much money on online shopping because the volume of online shopping ads that come into my newsfeed lifts exponentially and it's because I've been actually completing the shopping cart. So. When you do that, and Robin will take you through Google Ads stuff, I don't pretend to understand that. So, but with Facebook, you need to also be aware that you're talking to people at all different stages in the buying cycle. The same with all of your social media, really. You also have CVR, so the conversion ratio. So this shows you how many, shows you how effective your marketing campaigns are at converting clicks to sales. All right, so this is where you have to be able to track when uh, people go to your website, whether or not it's actually turning into a sale, okay? And again, these are not massive percentages. So you see, if you're running an ad, there's nothing there that says 50% or 20%. You know, you've got, where are we? Employment and training at 11% in terms of a conversion ratio once you actually get them to go to the website. But Again, it's about getting the right audiences and talking to people over time. So the thing that I always like to say about social media advertising versus Google advertising, Google advertising is implicit need. I've typed something into search because I want it, I want it now, and Google gives me some options, yeah? Social media advertising is implied need. I have a buyer persona, they look kind of like this. I think this is the person that mostly buys all of my stuff and I'm gonna put my ads in front of them in the hope that they have an immediate need or they feel like going shopping today. It's a bit like the game with having a pub or a retail outlet that does food. My one job is to be in front of them when they are hungry. All right, my one job is to be in front of them when they might be thirsty, when they might be making that decision as to whether or not they're gonna to go to this pub down the street or that one over there. All right, so at its simplest, most of my advertising is around just putting my brand in front of them with pretty pictures designed or video to make them feel hungry or thirsty. So think about the emotional tone that you're trying to achieve. This is kind of one of my favorite ones, this is cost per action benchmarks. So basically you can advertise um, based on people's specific actions when it comes to conversions, okay, and again, cost per action, so finance and insurance, I actually downloaded something or did what it was that I needed to do, you're talking $41.43, so this is probably like a cost per lead factor. So with all of those things, you need to really ask the question, how will your recommended strategy support you in achieving your business goals? So is your goal, in retail, and I hope that it's not. But is your goal that you just want brand awareness? That's just a thing. You want more people to know that you exist. I've never met a business owner that really just wants brand awareness. 
what they really want is sales and brand awareness is one of the paths that they're walking in the hope that it will generate sales, okay? So the good news about social media advertising is that every ad is kind of brand awareness. Unless they have that immediate need, if you put it in front of them and they had that immediate need, it turns into a conversion or a sales-based ad. But if it doesn't, then it's brand awareness. So the other thing to bear in mind with social media is that it's not a quick win. You can't run a campaign for like four weeks and go, I did that, what's happening now? My most successful client has been running Facebook ads for three years and their sales are up 320% year on year. They've been doing it for three years though. So the thing that most people forget is that in, over that three years, they amassed a massive amount of brand awareness so that whenever anybody thinks about their product or service, their brand is the one that comes to mind. In between times, they picked up sales and did all the things as well, but they built up that brand awareness over time. Which brings me to online reputation management. So how many of you guys have either TripAdvisor, Google reviews, Facebook reviews, those kinds of things. Show of hands, some of you, not many of you, okay. All right, really, really important that you respond to every single review. Okay, so every time that somebody leaves you a review on any single platform, try and engage them in a conversation. Okay, try and actually start a conversation with them because the more that they converse with you, the more that their friends or people that they're connected to see your brand, but the other thing is you solidify their relationship with your brand. They took the time to leave you a review, the least you can do is take the time to have a conversation with them about it. If they leave you an awful review, use it as an opportunity to at least try and turn it around. So my golden rule with awful online reviews, pretend that the person who left you the review is this far away from you is three times your size and really angry, okay? You're probably not gonna tell them to go get stuffed because they're three times your size. So a great example of like someone telling someone to go get stuffed, did anyone see the Victory Hotel blow up on Facebook a while ago? A couple of people? It wasn't pretty. It was entertaining, but it wasn't pretty. I, I may have made popcorn and sat down for a while. Um, the point being though, so that's a great example of a bad, handling of a negative customer review. He basically said, I'm sorry that your entire group couldn't get into my hotel and you stuffed up your booking, that's not really my problem, and then it went all downhill from there. So, choose to be the professionals that you are, choose to respond to it in a professional way. I'm sorry that that was your experience, can you send me a private message so that I can have the right person in the team get in touch with you? Can you give me your contact details? Most of the time, if you can drive it offline, even if they leave that negative review up there, the reality is that anybody that goes and sees it, sees that you dealt with it in a professional way. Most of us know that everyone has a bad day sometimes. Okay, it doesn't matter how well I train my staff, sometimes they're gonna stuff it up for me. And it's all in how I turn that around with the customers that makes or breaks the organization. Okay, so. On that note, here are my top four tips for retailers to get the most out of your social media. You need to do video, that's number one. So if you're gonna do video, you don't have to pay a videographer because we can't always afford $1,200 or $500 or $2,000 to do a video all the time. Don't get me wrong, there's a place for professional video, but you can get the rig that you need for about realistically for about 500 bucks. So long as you've got an iPhone, you can buy a set of lights off eBay for $145. You can buy a lapel mic from Video Guys for $20. You plug that into your phone, you've got sound. You will need a tripod so that you're not wobbling when you're filming. But the reality is between that and the apps that are online, you can cut and edit something pretty sharp for your social media channels and it doesn't have to be completely polished. Social is not your, video, um, your website. Okay, social is meant to be human, so you're allowed to have a little bit of human quality to it. So I recommend that you go out and get the equipment that you need and start to practice and play and ask yourself the question, how many aligned, non-competitive business owners do I know who have the same target market as me? And when was the last time that I actually got them all around a table to have a conversation about how we can cross-promote each other's businesses and help each other? Because Business, when done best, is done as a community, and the reality is that when you get 
those non-competitive business owners around you and you're all working together, it becomes much easier to do social because you can leverage off each other's profiles. All right, so the more people that you have that enable you to do that, the better. The other thing is you don't have to post three times a day, seven days a week. You don't have to post like left, right, center. Facebook's not going to reward you for that anymore. Facebook will reward you for posting decent original content. It will reward you for posting really good live video. It will reward you for doing things that get comments, likes, shares and interaction or are shared privately in Messenger. So it places a premium on that. So start getting a feel for what content your customers actually are interested in. In retail, it's kind of e easier in that you can go, here's a special deal, one day only, or it's, you know, here's a behind the scenes look at this shipment coming in, or we've just launched this new product. So ask yourself the question, how many pieces of news do you have that you can share? And share the news. Choose a face for your brand. That's the other thing that you kind of need to do. So the days of faceless companies, don't, they, it doesn't really work anymore. People still do business with people that they like, know or trust. You have to have a face for your brand in order for me to like, know or trust you. Okay, so I know that with the online director, if I'm dealing with the online director, I'm dealing with Robin and I like, know and trust Robin. You can tell I've dropped her name three times and she's about to go on stage. So, but the point is that if you look at any of her socials, you know that she's part of a large team but she's the front of the team. Okay, likewise, if you look at our stuff, we're part of a large team, but I'm the front of the team. You can come talk to me anytime. So get really clear, who is that person in your business? And it might not be you. It might be you have a fantastic staff member who is so bloody excited about what you guys do that you, know, you just warm to them naturally. And that's a great opportunity to put them on camera and make the most of it. So when you do those things, then teach yourself how to target it advertise to your target audience, push that content further, and then you'll be more successful at it. I'm done. Yeah, Thank you very much. Okay. yeah so I'm Lee Hardham, CEO and founder of Browse. Um, and yes, so we've uh, uh, had our, our startup now for almost five years, um, raised $2.25 million over those five years, and yes, spent $2.2 million of that of that money so um, yeah we've uh, come here and uh, brought you browse uh, and this is I guess what we've invested that money into um, I did like uh, before you uh, use the comment Reese uh, new retail um, you know we hear omni-channel retail uh, and all these different things that go in there um, but I guess we'd be uh, a new retail startup um, and with Browse, what we've created is your personal shopping browser where your search begins online but it finishes inside of a store, not a website. So I'll go through, uh, and I've got about 10 minutes on here, I think, so I'll try to go through. There's a fair bit of information up here. But the problem that we found there was that uh, if we look globally, there's about 3.5 billion searches entered into Google every single day. Uh, and my background uh, is in advertising. I used to work for News, News Corp. Uh, and I came to the realisation, um, you know, going back about seven years, years ago, that uh, every search that's being entered in is actually killing our retail stores. And I'll explain that a little bit more. Um, that's not to say don't do SEO. Uh, it's to say that SEO is very, very, very powerful. Um, so with search, we know that businesses with the biggest budgets or... Um, you know, the ones that can get uh, real estate on, on Google, on one of the 24, whoops, on one of the 24 uh, spaces that they have on Google, be that Google Places, Google AdWords, or a, or a search listing, um, it is favoured by the ones with the biggest budget. Uh, as I went on to my journey, I found something a little bit more concerning when you looked at it, is that uh, digital advertising is so powerful these days um, that it has a strong call to action and if you do it right, it'll take you actually to a digital address, not a physical address. As a retailer today, it is much more cost effective to deliver your product from a warehouse with a pick and pack distribution once they get to your web, uh, website rather than direct them back into your physical store. Once that happens, then you're competing with companies like Amazon. 
and we know that uh, you know Amazon are obviously masters of pick and pack distribution. So when we go through it, so the problem that we see there is search engines weren't made to drive traffic into stores, they were made to drive traffic to websites and they do it really, really well. So how did we fix it? Now there's a fair bit of text up there but I'll, I'll go through and I'll summarise that pretty quickly. Uh, so the way that we fixed it is to, similar to how Google index websites, uh, and they do that by search term, do it by letter, by word, by phrase, and then it indexes the website. We index uh, brands and products by store location. So if you're interested in a particular brand, um, we know that there are a certain amount of stores within a radius, we can drive inquiry back through those stores. Uh, and then what we do is we've created a personalised algorithm behind it all so that as you continuously browse within our platform and within our marketplace, we learn that you like a particular product or a particular category of products, a size, uh, a certain style, and then we use that to create your personal profile and suggest um, more brands that may suit you and suit your style. Finally, we had to come up with a way that would mean that you would start your search in browse uh, and not necessarily in Google, so we created a reward system. So every time you put a search term into browse, you'll actually earn rewards, which means that you'll have credit to spend at physical store locations just by searching, not buying. So I guess how does it work for a user? Uh, to kick it off and to begin, what happens is you jump onto browse, you create your profile, uh, and then you invite some friends. Once you've done that, you'll end up having uh, $30 uh, if you invite three friends. Uh, you'll end up having $30 to spend on the platform to begin your shopping journey. Uh, after that, we incentivize every action that you do. So if you do a search, you earn more rewards points. Those searches will equate to roughly about 50 cents. Uh, you can place an inquiry. An inquiry will be worth uh, $2. And then if you make an actual purchase through one of those stores, it's worth $2.50. So the way that we've made, it, I guess, uh, the benefit for a consumer and how it works uh, for a consumer is that once you jump onto the platform, uh, you may look up a particular product. Um, say I look up uh, a pair of uh, Adidas Gazelles. Uh, I'll jump on there and get the Adidas Gazelles. I'll set the radius in which I want to put the inquiry through. So I do five kilometers. Uh, it'll tell me that there are 10 stores that stock Adidas within there. I hit the inquiry button. That gets logged with us in our call centre uh, and then we do all the work for you. We'll ring those stores, uh, get a response back to you. Right now we're looking at a two hour response time, um, but we want to shorten that obviously to as quick as possible. Uh, and then we'll ring up those stores, find out if they've got the product, uh, and then it goes back to the consumer and tells them uh, that that product is available or not available. If it's an actual store that activates their account with Browse, um, the consumer will actually be able to buy now and collect that product in store with all of those notifications going live into store. Uh, then we partnered with uh, companies like Parcel uh, who can facilitate a three hour delivery from store to customer. So we're really working with, uh, I guess, uh, the strength of having those store locations over what happens when you have a website and getting that immediate delivery to occur as well. So uh, here's a little look at, I guess, how it works. Um, so with Browse, we get you to kick off. We use the image recognition technology within uh, Browse as well. So you can do an, a text-based search or you could do an image-based search. Um, if you see an item you like, you can snap a picture from the app, load it through, and it will actually create a uh, collection or a mood board for you so that, that you can um, start to personalise your shopping feed. Our, um, our, I guess our machine learning uh, within the back end of our system then categorises all products uh, within Browse uh, by what you've looked at before or by your collections uh, and your mood board. So it creates a personalised feed for you wherever you go. And then uh, we connect you back through into those physical store locations and like I was saying before, you've got the click or collect or the three hour delivery. Uh, so benefits for retailers. Um, Number one, we're driving foot traffic back into the stores and we're driving sales back into the stores. So instead of that inquiry coming from online and ending up with an online sale with a pick and pack distribution, that sale's getting generated and it's getting put through to the stores. So we're involving you in the process. Um, you know, it is our goal that we get market share back from online uh, through Browse. 
Um, so yeah, so you are able to grow your sales. Then what we do uh, with Browse as well, uh, we've invested our, our money into uh, taking you into that next step further as well. So we've actually developed technology that enables us to use that personal profile that's been created on each individual user and give it to your staff members in store. Uh, so uh, we have a beacon technology that we can put into the store later on once you're a part of the platform. Uh, and then as a customer, I could be browsing online. I can look and I can see the different products that I want. Uh, we have your personal profile. Uh, as I walk and approach into a store, the staff will be notified to say that Lee's entering into the store uh, and the staff within the store will be able to personalise that experience for me as well. So we've got an option. Either I can give you a lay of the land for everything Google, so a combination of SEO, AdWords and Maps, or I can give you a traps for young players in AdWords. So I think the best way for us to decide this is hands up if you are actively running an AdWords account. Okay, so that's probably the minority of the audience. So I'm sorry guys, I'm actually going to go with the, we're going to go with an eight minute Google lesson. So you might learn things that you already know, however you might also learn something new. So $25.8 billion is what was spent in Google in 2017. So there's a fair bit of people using it that Bing tries to tell us that they are 12% of Australia's search traffic. I also know that the highest searched term in Bing is Google. So <laughs> they might have 12% of the first search However, as for the actual total search volume that's done in Australia, Google sits at about 97% of all searches done in Australia. All right, we're gonna cut through. All right, so Google search. So when you do a Google search, and sorry that that's not particularly clear, but if you've got your phones handy, you can play along at home. I want you to Google Locksmiths Adelaide. So your top four are going to be paid results. So I will come back to that in more detail. After your paid results, you've got your Google Maps, which is literally Google's phone book. So ironically, this data actually used to come from the Yellow Pages. So Google had an agreement with the Yellow Pages up until about four years ago that everybody that was in Yellow Pages automatically had their data pushed through to Google every 30 days. So if your business is more than four years old, it's extremely possible that you have a Google Maps listing that you've either verified or unverified. If your business is less than four years old, post that agreement with the Yellow Pages, unless you have signed up manually, it's possible you don't have a Google Maps listing. It really is the Google black hole that just because you have a business doesn't mean you have one. Just because you have a website doesn't mean you have one. It's not the job of the web designer. It's not the job of the IT company. It's not the job of the AdWords company. It's really no man's land. That It needs to become something that as a business owner, that going back five, 10 years ago, you would have woken up and gone, I'm starting a business. I've got to call the yellow pages. You know, the whole not happy Jan ad that it's, it should seriously be the same thing, but I've got to do my Google My Business listing, I've got to get it verified, I've got to get my opening hours in there. So, free, Google, Google My Business. Make sure you have access to that listing. Make sure your opening hours are accurate. So, in this instance here, so if you've Googled the locksmith on your phone, Google would be showing you the three that it deems to be most relevant. Now, when you say Adelaide, Google actually thinks that you mean the CBD, which is excellent if you are actually a business in the Adelaide City Council. So, <laughs> so it will normally show the three locksmiths that are based in the Adelaide City. Having things like reviews, opening hours, content is king when it comes to Google. So the more information that you can have on these listings, the better you are. How am I going on that timer? Nice, thank you. <laughs> After your maps listings, you get your organic listings. So every single website is scored by Google. It is made up of over 200 different factors that change more than once a day. They're things like, 
Uh, what are the keywords in your website? How quickly does your website load? And on that, three seconds. Google says anything longer than three seconds and you are losing customers. Does your website work on a mobile phone? How many unique visitors do you have? How many visitors do you have that visit multiple pages? How many times has your website been loaded by the same user within a 30-day period? So over 200 different factors, and there's no one magic factor that you can't go, oh, it's all right, I set my website as my homepage, I visit it every day, I've SEO'd it. No magic factor. So there's an entire industry dedicated to helping businesses try and improve this overall ranking with Google. It's called SEO, which stands for Search Engine Optimization. Was that on your, that was on the family feud list. So to an extent, Google will let every business know best practice. It will let the businesses know where it should be hosted, that it should have Google Analytics on it, that you should be using Google Tag Manager. But Google will never tell Jim's locksmiths what it needs to do to outrank Adelaide locksmiths. So that all becomes a trial and error. So you know, go back, cast your mind back to when you were in school and your teachers would talk to you about algebra and they'd go, one day you'll use this. So this, is what <laughs> this is what these SEO people do every single day. They do not know what X is, so they work in the background to work out what X is. So Google then tweaks their algorithm every single day and then overhauls their algorithm every six months. So these SEO people are absolute sadists. Like, who does that? <laughs> who does a job that you could never win at? So, so when you, so again, so even if you engage an SEO company, you can't say, I've SEO'd my website, I am done. It is a constant thing. And it is also one of those things that you need to make sure you are using the right company. Because there are ways that you can trick Google. So, Going back old school, you used to be able to do things like link farms, link to websites that had higher points than someone else did and get you up there further. What happens is if Google catches you for doing something that's not in the end user's best interest, you run the risk of being blacklisted by Google. And being blacklisted by Google, just say 97% of Australian searches, is not going to be great for your business. And it's like a bankruptcy. So even if you do clear and go back to best practice with Google, you will still be that business in Google's eyes. So, uh, let me tell you about Parcel. Oh, sorry, let me tell you about the problem first. That last five years, this stat's been pretty steady. So, seven out of 10 people who make it to the checkout after you've optimized your SEO and paid for your Facebook ads, about seven out of 10 people abandon the shopping cart. When they're asked why, shipping is about half the problem, whether it's too expensive or it's too slow, and usually a combination of both. Um, another problem that's happened in Australia recently is that that quote has been attributed to Jeff Bezos from Amazon. Um, we're now competing as local retailers against multinational companies that genuinely do not care about profit. They're all about revenue, they're all about land grab. So when they offer free shipping or $20 vouchers um, in the street, all they're trying to do is get the customer because they're worried about the, well, they're looking for the next sale and the next 10 sales. So as smaller retailers, independent retailers, we're up against people who don't care about profit, they're probably not paying tax in Australia as well, and they're all about a land grab globally. So our solution to that is to get regular people to do the deliveries on the way home. So what Reese was asking for before was that show of hands, is Parcel is a very, very simple service. We have thousands of people who have our app downloaded, which is free to download. And what that app does is it builds up a location map of where you go and where you are. And from time to time, we'll send someone a message saying, hey, we know where you are, and we're pretty confident that we know where you're going, and your next door neighbour's just ordered a shirt from, what was the store you told me before? Peter Shearer. So your next door neighbour's just ordered a shirt from Peter Shearer. So and we'll say, we'll pay you 10 bucks to deliver that on your way home. We're not looking for Uber drivers, we're not looking for people who are trying to make money. We're basically looking for people who say, listen, I've got to go home anyway, my car's already in the city and I'm going to drive home. And now I'm going to go and drive home with a shopping bag in there and I just pick up 10 bucks. Um, we reward that 10 bucks with a gift voucher or an EFT. We'll come to the gift vouchers in a minute. Um, so, again, this is how it works. It's very, very simple. You don't have to be an online retailer to have it. So we can integrate with shopping carts, with Shopify, Magento, whatever else. Um, a lot of our customers don't have that. They just, we just give them a really simple web booking form 
and people phone the, the store or people will come in and say, listen, can you deliver um, a baby basket to my daughter-in-law who's just had a baby? So we can integrate with that. So you get it ready in the store, then we look at the thousands of people and we choose the best one for the delivery. They come and pick it up and they deliver it. And the three hours is the key. And another key for what we do is that we will deliver whenever your stores are open. So weekends, evenings, public holidays, four o'clock on Christmas Eve, when no one wants to come in the city for that last minute purchase, we can deliver. The uh, charge for our service is $15, and that's a $15 flat rate. So if it's um, Monday morning, 9 o'clock, it's $15. If it's 4 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, it's um, $15. We reward the passes with a $10 gift certificate, or EFT. The gift certificate's key because our partner retailers, we encourage them to offer their gift certificates to the passer. And so now what we're doing is not only do we get the first sale that you might have missed out online, but now we're also bringing someone else into the store who is a potential customer. And our target passers, who are the people who do our deliveries, are 18 to 45 year old females. Not exclusively, we don't exclude anyone, but 18 to 45 females, who work, run into these sort of groups. They're either work in retail, which means a 10 buck um, gift voucher every now and then is quite handy. They're a busy housewife who might come into the shops every now and then and buy something. Or they're what we call Sally Shopper, which is your 20-something uh, female who uh, likes to shop and identifies as like to shop. And that's Parcel.